Um, like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see them and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, that was the voice of Alex Murdoch. On the night of the double homicide, uh, it's a, his first police statement from the 8th of June 2021, just before 1 o'clock in the morning, around about four hours after the incident. And so what we're going to deal with in this analysis are 10 red flags in seven minutes, in the first seven minutes of his police statement. Now, Brian Enton has posted five times seven minute clips of Murdoch's uh, approximately 35 minute initial statement to the cops, as I say, made it around 1 a.m. In this analysis, we'll restrict ourselves to the first seven minutes of Murdoch's statement. If you'd like me to dive deeper after dealing with this analysis, let me know in the comments. I'm not going to start with the obvious red flags, uh, the clean white shirt, etc., but instead the less obvious ones, the behavioral aspects. And then we will circle back to the white shirt at the end. I will be playing video and audio and then and analyzing that. But before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you want to watch the original audio, the seven minutes that this episode is based on, I'll put a link to Brian Enton's uh, clip, the clip on Brian Enton's uh, Twitter profile. I'll put a link to that in the description. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So, number one, hypervigilant. At one, at one second into clip one, Murdoch uh, looks straight into the onboard camera. Does he look dirty or distressed? Does he look like he's been crying? Before he says anything, does he look emotional or calm and composed? And although I said I wouldn't talk about the, the shirt in the beginning... If he is hypervigilant, one of the things he's going to be doing is removing his clothing before anything else. Is that what's happened here? Is that part of that hypervigilance? Number two, cleaning his glasses. Within the first minute of the interview, Murdoch uh, apparent, uh, abruptly pulls out one of two pairs of glasses from the pocket of his white shirt and he begins cleaning them. He has a white tissue in his hand and he cleans his glasses with them, not his face, but the glasses, which he doesn't need to put on at, in that moment, or at any moment during the first seven minutes. This cleaning, this idea of cleaning of the glasses, seems like nervous, fidgety energy. But it is interesting that the first action we presented with, one that he volunteers um, w after he sees the camera, is cleaning. Number three, daydreaming or dissociative. We get our first glimpse of what we may want to refer to as Murdoch's uh, emotional range or his psychological range. Uh, and we get that within about uh, 70 seconds where we see Murdoch's, uh, alt he alternates from a hypervigilant, alert and fidgety state to a sort of fugue state. No, he's not suffering from amnesia, but he is psychologically giving himself a break. He's sort of tuning out while going through the humdrum of giving his, his date of birth. This grounds him in his own reality. It's a kind of ASMR that takes him back into his own reality, the, the, uh, the fabric of his life and circumstances. And um, that leads him into a dissociative state. This dissociative moment right at the beginning of questioning is an early clue, I think, that we may be dealing with an individual who has been dissociative in a more general sense. Dissociation is not a very good way uh, of dealing with reality. It refers to a disconnection and fragmented sense of the world and others, and the relationship between the self, one's identity, and surroundings. It, it shows that that is all in a state of flux or even chaos. Instead of being glued and connected 
to other people, it's the opposite. You've come unstuck, unglued, disconnected, dissociated. And along with that, dissociation is a disconnection with reality. And you often see this, the same thing with criminals. And crime often arises as a result of this failure to adapt to reality. And I so, so often in my analysis, what we need to be is experts at reality. And, and that will help us in our own personal lives. Because we see again and again suspects and criminals who can't deal with or can't face up to or can't adapt to their realities. Instead, what you see here is reality being made or forced to adapt to them. When the detective asks for Murdo's lawyer's name, and I believe Danny Henderson is his lawyer, and that is pretty quick lawyering up as well. Again, this idea of hypervigilance. Murdoch uh, remains in a sort of daydream dissociated state. Number four, I understand you don't have any problem with it. I hate to have to do this. I understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't, you don't have any problem yeah. with it. That happens at about 95 seconds into the interview. The detective apologizes for having to go there. And here one can see again just how jumpy or wired or hypervigilant Murdoch is. He's bobbing his head as if trying to soothe himself or building himself up. But it's the speed at which he tells the cop he understands that's astonishing. The words that follow are even more astonishing. He's supposed to say, I don't have any problem with you questioning me, but instead he frames it. He frames the whole situation as, I understand you don't have any problem with it. Semantically, we're talking about the idea that the cops are presented with a husband who's about to tell the story about how he found his wife and son murdered in a particularly heinous way. And clearly, where we are now, 19 months later, the cops did end up having a real problem with Murdoch and his version of events. There are some reports saying they didn't seem shed any tears. And now, of course, he's the biggest crybaby in court, constantly shedding tears. Constantly we see tissues, well, appearing to shed tears, appearing to cry. But are there any real tears? Now, bear in mind, in terms of this moment here, a moment ago, Murdoch was in a, a dissociative state. And I think some of that is washed into his words. He wishes no one is going to have any problems with what has happened, or more specifically with him. But I mean, what he's about to say, and he's sitting there in a white shirt with no sweat on it. I mean, has he not been running around? Has he not been in a heightened state? Is he not in a heightened state? And is, there's no perspiration on his shirt. His shirt's dry. And... It's no wonder this is making the news on basically day one after the opening statements. This is what the prosecution are focusing on. Basically, the first things Murdoch said and did, did it, did it pass the smell test? Is his behavior appropriate? And we, we saw similar sort of analysis in the Morphew case when Barry Morphew arrived on the scene. And so... Murdoch seems to be saying, you don't have any problem with it? Well, actually, Mr. Murdoch, we do. Number five, Murdoch's version of events. At about 100 seconds, the cop gives Murdoch a, the green light to start at the top and relay what he knows. Have a look at the look in Murdoch's eyes when he starts off. He's saying, like when I came back here. So he's starting off by saying he wasn't there. He says, I mean, I pulled up and I could see him and I knew something was bad. Now, when you look at a map of the terrain, it's not that you would just pull up. The kennels are in a sort of a triangle. If you think about the house at the top of the triangle, the entrance gate at the bottom, the kennels are at the far side. So how would he know to go there? And that is another part that's just missing from his story. He pulls up, he can see them, he knew something was bad. How did he know to go there in the first place? Why did he not go to the house in the first place? Why did he not um, call out at the house in the first place? 
Why did he not call them on their phones when he was at the house in the first place? Why would that be the first place to pull up to? So not to put too fine a point on it, but it was nighttime. They were lying on the ground covered in blood. How was he sure what was going on? And he, he says that he was sure. He says, I could see him. I knew something was bad. I knew it. How could he be so sure? Why would they be out here in the dark at 10.06 p.m.? Why would they be out there? And then those words, and he repeats them in the 911 call as well, right? I knew something was bad. Let's uh, listen into that. They also have him absolutely certain that they didn't shoot themselves. Anyway, he also says in the 911 call, this is Alex Murdoch at the at 4147 Moselle Road. He says, I need the police and ambulance immediately. My child and my wife have been shot badly. And then also, I've been up to it now. It's bad. This statement reminds me of what Chris Watts said, that it felt like he was in a nightmare that he couldn't wake up from. I knew something was bad. I've been up to it now. It's bad, right? Those words are a mirror to something else that was eating at Murdoch. What was it? What else did he know was bad? That brings us to number six, genuine emotion or conflicted emotion. It's difficult not to be moved or touched by Murdoch's sudden breaking down. And both his lawyer and the cop sitting behind him seem to be genuinely touched by Murdoch's apparent grief. He's definitely not above uh, showing emotion, right, in court or in the situation. And I think some aspects of his emotion are genuine, especially as it pertains to his son. But he seems to be less emotional about his wife, who sustained five gunshot wounds compared to Paul's two. Maggie, 52 years old, had five distinct gunshot wounds. There was a wound to the left side of her torso, um, head injuries, to her left breast, lower jaw, ear, skull, and brain. And that also includes one to the back of her head. The weapon used was a semi-automatic rifle and totally different weapon to the one used on Paul, their 22-year-old son. The fact that Maggie was found face down, found face down, means well, she really turned around and also it gives you an idea um, how she was sort of facing and where the perpetrator was from in order for her to end up in that position. Paul had two distinct gunshot wounds, one to his chest and shoulder, right, and the other to his head. The latter included a entrance wound through the left shoulder and side of the neck proceeding upward from front to back, exiting the top of his head. Paul was also found lying face down, his hands under his body and a smartphone propped on his back. So again, you've got to ask if his father checked for a pulse, how could he do that with his son's hands lying under his body? Also, if he turned him over, why are they both still lying face down? But just the fact that the mother has five bullet wounds and the son too, I think maybe tells you something. Also, the amount of emotion that the father um, demonstrates in terms of his son versus his wife. We've got to be careful not to allow sentiment to cloud our minds. Uh, Murdoch's job is to describe the scene in terms of right now, in terms of his police statement. And being emotional is allowing him to sidestep exactly that. Also, in terms of the emotional range I mentioned earlier, one moment he's daydreaming, the next he's breaking down, only for him to be fine again. I mean, he breaks down for a few seconds. And then he's absolutely fine for the next several minutes. Also, for all the snot and thrana, as we say in Afrikaans, that means snot and tears. He doesn't seem to use that tissue even once to wipe his nose or face. 
And as we see in the Watts case, there is sniffing and sniveling, but we never see actual tears running down his face. Now, it's one thing to say, well, uh, he's not a crier, but he certainly appears to be. It certainly appears as if he's crying, but you just never see actual tears. Also, his voice is inflected with grief, but there are no actual tears running down his cheeks. He also, like Chris Watts, covers his face while apparently crying and talking in a kind of slightly high-pitched voice. At 2.34, you see him unraveling the tissue or napkin in his hand, but he never actually uses it. He seems to be absently wiping his fingers with it. Now, notice the cop next to him who is wiping his perspiring neck with a white cloth. Number seven. Oh, hold on, I forgot something. Within moments of breaking down crying, Murdoch uh, recovers himself and starts to describe going to his wife, only to backtrack interrupting his own story, self-interrupting to establish a point. And it is actually an important point. He says, actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Look at those words. I think. I tried. Did you turn him over or didn't you? Now, notice the lack of conviction here. I think I tried compared to the absolute conviction right in the beginning where he says, how no, uh, they didn't shoot themselves, and I pulled up and I could see him, and I knew something was bad. And the 911 call, I knew something was bad, I've been up to it now, it's bad. Now, my personal opinion is that he didn't touch either of the victims. If he intended to kill them, then it was obvious that they were dead, and there was no need to check for signs of life. And he also wouldn't want any evidence on him. But on second thoughts, actually, he would need to touch them as their father and as a husband and as an innocent man arriving later on the scene trying to find out what what had happened and in the dark. Except, why did he need to do that if it was so obvious? He says, I pulled up, I could see him and I knew something was bad. Whoopsie. If there was blood everywhere and if he touched the victims, why is there not a drop of blood anywhere on Murdoch? Not on his hands? Not on his shirt that is white as the driven snow. And we're now moving on to red flag number eight. And we're not even halfway through the first clip. We're not even at the three minute mark. Number eight is whoopsie. Murdoch shifts slightly in his seat and he repeats, you know, uh, I tried to turn him over and I, I don't know. I figured it out. And I ran over to Maggie. And uh, actually, I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um, uh, you know, I tried to turn him over and, uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, do you see the contradiction? You know, I don't know. You know, I pulled up, I could see him. I knew something was bad. I tried to turn him over and I figured it out. These are inconsistent statements. And that brings us to number nine. His cell phone popped out of his pocket. Uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. That's started to try to do something with it thinking maybe but then I put it back down really quickly that's quite a flippant whimsical way of putting it you know his cell phone fell out of his pocket or it slipped out or dropped out but popped out is similar to the top of Paul's brain popping off right remember no matter what story Murdoch is trying to tell by telling it he's remembering it and even if we try to consciously lie we can't lie to our subconscious so he says started try to do something with it that's a reference to Paul's cell phone thinking maybe but then I put it down really quickly talking about garbled what does that even mean by the way you also had Oscar Pistorius surrounded by blood in his story Reva was still alive and he was kind of performing CPR and in the middle of that he's handling Reva's phone as well right after uh, she He'd shot her to death. Three bullets. He's holding her phone. What for? Also, Chris Watts has Shanann's phone. Why? In any event, in the middle of everything, Murdoch acknowledges handling his, his son's phone. Now, why would he want to do that? Doesn't he need to check on his wife? Why is he checking on his son's phone even before going to his wife? Isn't that a true statement as well, that he did check on his, his um, son's phone? 
And if he did, then maybe that's how he got blood on him and maybe possibly why he needed to wash himself and wash his clothing. But that's not that's not checking for signs of life. That's checking for evidence of on him on his son's phone, possibly. And then the tenth and last one. And then I went to my wife. I mean, I could see. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. This seems to be a tailoring of the version he gave about his son. Now he doesn't need to turn her over because, I mean, he can see. At 3.10 to 3.12, Murdoch does a fraction of the grief thing he did for his son, indicating his feelings for Maggie are different to those for Paul. At 3.16, the cop asks him the first question, did you touch Maggie at all? Murdoch responds that he did, but then he broadens it to, I touched them both. I try to do it. I try to do it as limited as possible. Try to do what? But I try to take a pulse on both of them. Let's listen. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but how could you take their pulse with them f lying face down? How can you determine signs of life with them lying face down? And in this description, uh, why does he need to do it as limited as possible? Why is he overthinking it? You know, take their pulse, end of story, check for signs of life. Does he give any indication here of their faces, their eyes, signs of life? That is what most people would be looking at. Looking at eyes, looking for reaction in eyes, looking at a mouth. Is the mouth moving or breathing? Well, it's up to the cop now to ask the obvious question and direct Murdoch to the word that he won't say. He brought up brains right in the beginning, but he can't seem to say another word starting with B. Do you think it's true that Murdoch called 911 in his, in his words pretty much right away? It's, it's another uncertain statement. He's got conviction about other things, but 911 he calls pretty much right away. Well, about an hour and 15 minutes after the shooting is definitely not pretty much right away. Is there any proof that he was at the hospital with his father? In the Rebecca Zahal case, there is CCTV footage where you can see people related to that case entering and leaving the hospital. Any of that here? And if Murdoch wasn't at the hospital, where was he? And what was he doing for 80 minutes? And I have been trying to find information about the house and if they found anything inside the house, did they look at the washing machine, did they look at the laundry? So far, I haven't been able to see that, but maybe that'll come out at trial. So I'm not going to take it further than that, but I think you'll agree that um, it's really not rocket science in the first three, four minutes to sort of notice that things aren't really adding up. Things don't really make a lot of sense. See, things seem to be in a behavioral sense and in a logical sense all not right, really so standing up to okay. scrutiny. Do, uh, if you guys want me to uh, analyze part two, let me know in the comments. If you want to watch the whole of part one, dealing with the first seven minutes, then you can watch the rest of this episode. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. Can you state your full name for me, please? Richard Alexander Murdoch. <clears throat> And spell your last name so I get it correct. M U R D A U G H. All right. And you go by Alec? Yes, sir. And date of birth, Mr. Murdoch? May 27, 1968. And a good phone number for you 803 And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Um, as I stated, I'm David Owen, 
and uh, Laura Rutland with Collington County and I'm with SLED. <laughs> I hate to have to do this. I but, understand. Yeah. I totally yeah. understand. Yeah. So you don't you don't have any problem yeah. with it. So um just start the to top, take your time. Um like when I came back here, mm -hmm. I mean, I pulled up and I could see them and, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see it was. And I could see his brain on his... <laughs> and I ran over to Maggie and uh, actually I think I tried to turn Paul over first. Um uh you know, I tried to turn him over, and uh, I don't know. I figured it out. Um, uh, his cell phone popped out of his pocket. I started to try to do something with it, thinking maybe, but then I put it back down really quickly. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, uh, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. mm, Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I called 911 um, pretty much right away, and she was very good. Um, I talked to her. Um, I told her I was going to get off the phone to call some family members. <coughs> I did that. Um, and, um... What family members did you call him? I called my brother Randy. And I called my brother John. And I tried to call a little boy real good friend that's right around the corner from here but i didn't get him okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> what all was around um paul when you walked up blood any any other anything else i mean there was some body mm -hmm. things yes sir i mean like any other evidence i know you said the phone fell out the pocket um but did you see anything else that didn't belong or shouldn't belong or that wasn't part of Paul? No, sir. Not, no, not good. No, sir. How about Maggie? No, sir. You didn't see anything around them? What made you come out here tonight? Um, I went to my mom's a late stage Alzheimer's patient. My dad's in the hospital. Um, my mom gets anxious when she does. I went to check on them and Maggie. Maggie's a dog lover and okay. she fools with the dogs. And I knew she'd gone to the kennel. I was at the house. I left the house and went to my mom's <clears throat> for just a little while. Tried to call her when I left. <coughs> Texted her, no response. Um, When I got back to the house, the house was obviously nobody was in there. So I figured they're still up here fooling around. Paul was um, gonna be getting set up to plant. Our sunflower seeds got sprayed and died and he was refiguring to do, to plant the sunflower seeds. Okay. So I came back up here and I drove up and saw and called. Uh -huh. 
had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. And yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. You know his date of birth? I do. April 11, 96 is his brother's April 14th, 99. Now it's Paul's.